They call it asteroid mining, but it's almost never an actual asteroid. Actual asteroids are mined mostly by drones and automatons, as it's pretty safe for them to do so. They simply have to break it into pieces, bring it into the forge, and the forge is automated as well, does the work. So you would think just mining asteroids would be enough for all the species to take care of any of their material needs. You'd be wrong. On satellites like this one orbiting a gas giant, you have other mines that are set up. Ones with planetoids that are very large, too large to be torn apart by drones. Not to mention, the risk to the drones is too high. And according to them, drones are expensive, lives are cheap. Inside these mines, you'll find a very, very interesting group. At least 50% of all the mines are prisoners. Prisoners sent to what's known as hard labor. Along with that, you have those who have no place to go. People who are escaping something, many of them criminals. Other ones are just there because they're just there. No one knows why. These are the ones that don't talk much. Among this group, there's one that stuck out. It was a very large bipedal being. He was very, very big. We didn't know much about him. He didn't talk. However, when he did speak, everyone listened. Though there wasn't much downtime at all. Most everyone worked themselves until they just about passed out, but you didn't dare pass out or you'd be docked a day's pay for sleeping on the job. We knew this was dangerous work, and many people died to cave-ins, to explosions, to different hazards inside the mines. Sometimes a simple bacterial infection will put someone down in less than a day. Along with that was the lack of breathable atmosphere that was down inside the mines. And yet... They still sent us down, no matter how many died in the mines. Again, robots are expensive. Lives are cheap. That's the way they looked at us. And everyone originally blamed the company itself. They believed the company that invested in these mines were the reasons why we were all thrown down. But it wasn't them. It was the ones who worked for the company. This group decided that they would come in, and anyone who was here, whether they be a prisoner, a criminal, or just someone looking for a job, would have to pay part of their paycheck to be given the privilege of working in such hellish conditions. If you complained at all, they threatened to take away your livelihood, threatened your pay, and of course, if you couldn't pay your rent, they would kick you out, but where are you going to go? We're orbiting a gas giant on the ass end of nowhere. And of course, you couldn't buy anything outside of their company store. If you did anything like that, if you went against them in any way, shape, or form, then you were totally screwed. They would tell you you have 24 hours to get off that rock or they would throw you out of an airlock as you would be trespassing. And then... No, they wouldn't throw you out of the airlock. It was even worse than that. The airlock was actually something you looked forward to in that case. Instead, you would be made a prisoner and given starvation rations while forced to work for free. They did this sometimes, just grabbing a random worker and doing this, sometimes just to scare, other times just to straighten their books. Those in charge grew fat and happy, many of them sitting behind a desk Every once in a while, if you walk past, you would see them sleeping behind with their massive, bulbous guts hanging over. The reason for all this was simple. Due to galactic law, companies had to follow a strict set of guidelines. If they were investigated, even the slightest little bit messing any of the standards, then they would be fined into oblivion. However, if they outsourced it to this union of cohorts of theirs, then they would simply have to work for us. The company may have to follow the rules, the rest of them don't. It was just that simple. And most did not realize that if they signed up to work in the mines, or if they were forced to work, there was no way out. There was no way to save enough money to get off because as soon as they realized someone was saving up the credits to get on a transport, they would simply raise the rates. 
more and more and more. You were a debt slave constantly. And then you would be looking for the airlock. It was fairly common that several would end themselves this way. In one case, a female, realizing that she had been impregnated by one of the ones who controlled this mine, realized that she would be used as a breeding sow from there on out, and simply ran towards the airlock to absolute no one's shock. The one that had forced her to get impregnated by holding her down, lifting his bulbous gut and forcing himself on her, simply watched and laughed. And as her body drifted into space, as she reached for her throat and reached across her thorax, trying desperately to get any type of air in, as her internal bulbous lungs imploded and then blew out the top of her head, he simply laughed and stated, Well, I'll just get another one, and then began to look through the mines for the next attractive female that may be there. If anyone dared to stop them, well, you already know what's going to happen. Through all this, there was only a little bit of hope with all of us. We all hoped that maybe, maybe someone would come to help us. To our surprise, help did not come until after one of the worst accidents in the mine's history. There was a sudden rumble inside the mines. It wasn't a detonator that went off. Somehow we had struck a fault line. And no one told us about this. Those in charge, this union of assholes, was supposed to tell us where the fault lines were. Yet the fault line itself split, ruptured, shook, and began to bring the entire mine down. The support struts that were holding it up buckled under the weight, many of them cracking and splitting and beginning to fall down. And all those inside were suddenly pitched in darkness. Many had their lights on, looking around for anything, any way to get out. Without skipping a beat, the large human ran down into the mines with no equipment at all, running in through the darkness, through the dust. Many of those on the surface believed that he was looking for a quick and easy way out. We knew that he was in here for something dangerous as we realized someone as large as him had to be in for something. And the rumor was that with one strike of that large right paw of his, he had sent another one of the miners to the great beyond. So we believed that this was him looking for a way out. We were wrong. John reached the strut. He placed his wide shoulders underneath, braced his hands, and even though he was narrow at the hip compared to his shoulders, he pushed with everything he could, and with a mighty groan, the entire area shifted, and suddenly one of the miners, still trapped underneath, just yelled, There's a light up above! And everyone bolted for the light they could see, running right past John, running out of the cave, trying desperately to save their own lives. As many of them realized what was going on as they reached the surface, they all suddenly turned around with all sorts of jacks and support struts and headed towards the cave, and then there was a rumbling again. The rumbling forced another burst to come out of the cave. Everyone stopped. We all knew what was going on. We all knew that the cave itself, the entire tunnel, had just collapsed. Many dropped to their knees, many to their multiple knees. Those that could began to pray. Others simply stood there in complete shock. The one who was in control started screaming at everyone to get back to work and start clearing the mine, but no one moved for a moment. When it came up and he grabbed a hold of one of the nearest males, that man had simply had enough. Spinning around, he shoved one of his talons into the boss's throat and ripped it clean open. With that, everyone turned, and with rage that they'd been holding on for so long, simply began to riot throughout the entire area. They started taking out the guards, taking their weapons, and pushing all the way to the comms area. Those inside the comms area were petrified at what was going on. They screamed for everyone not to hurt them. 
And yet, they were told specifically, if they don't want to die, to send out the distress call. The one in charge of the communication simply said he already had. They said, no, no, not to your boss. General distress call. And the one who was over the comms opened all six of his eyes very wide. Clearly scared to death of what would happen if they did that. Then one of the miners walked up, grabbed the one behind the comms, and ripped two of his arms clean off. Then he turned and said, who else here knows how to operate this piece of machinery? Three others jumped up immediately and started broadcasting a distress signal. It was clearly broadband, and it was simple, a mayday. And it didn't take long. A ship jumped into the area. They didn't know the design, but it jumped in fairly quick. On the side, they could see many turrets. This was clearly some sort of warbird, but they didn't know if it was a destroyer, a cruiser, or what. It seemed large, very large. And pretty soon, several different shuttles began to come down from it. The shuttles landed inside the area, right next to where the boss's body was still laying and a whole bunch of bipedal armor suits came out. Everyone recognized this form. Everyone knew what they were looking at, just not who. The one in front called from his metal suit and said, who's in charge? With that, several of the miners walked up and stated there was no one left in charge, but they need to know what's going on here. As soon as the humans that had landed found out that one of their own was left to die and they were simply going to keep digging on top of his corpse, they were angry. But none more angry than one of the armor-clad bipedals that came down. He went up and ran towards the mine as fast as he could. No one could stop him. No one could even get in his way without being tossed aside like an insect. And in some cases, this was literal. He went towards the mine and started crawling inside, screaming for his friend. Apparently, he knew John. But everyone stopped him. And eventually, his own commander grabbed him by the shoulder and started screaming obscenities in a foreign language right into his face. We all realized that he was in serious pain, emotions ripping apart. From that day forward, the mine itself was shut down. The atrocities of not only the company, but those who had brought the rest of the company's men to heal were brought into the light. Their union was dissolved fairly quickly in that one sector. Unfortunately, that sector was controlled by the humans and they had a very strong passion against such treatment. In fact, they were so adamant about disbanding any and all of these mining operations that they offered sanctuary for all those inside the mining facility. This surprised everyone and they didn't realize that a type of creature that is known to be dangerous would be so caring. But that was shown again towards the end right before everyone got on their shuttles. They were brought over to the front of the mine, and each of them stood there while the human that had tried to dig his way into the mine brought up a plaque in several different languages. It had a simple phrase, though we couldn't read the name because it was in the human's original language. Each of us could see the phrase beneath it that stated, at the bottom of this hole lies a big, big man.